My name is Pat Matheny, and we are doing an interview. You know, music to me is sort of before any instrument. And, you know, I write almost everything on piano. I started out as a trumpet player. And yet, or let's say my, the best translation device I have is the guitar because I've done it the longest. So for me, I don't think about guitar too much. I think more about it, meaning the ideas, the sound, the, the conception, the, the spirit, the feeling of it. And then the guitar is just this representation of what those ideas are. I kind of think about music sort of within the realm of music, which could manifest itself on the guitar, it could be an orchestra, it could be piano, it could be another musician, it could be somebody singing. It's not specific to a thing. That's orchestration. And to me, there is a point where orchestration is a, an important part of the deal. When I write something, and because I'm supposed to be a well-known guitar player, I have to have a part for myself, right? Sometimes that's difficult as I'm writing everything on piano. It's sort of like, okay, what am I going to play here? But once I establish, okay, the guitar part could be this, then I kind of have to check out the orchestration. And in, in, at this point, it could be nylon string, it could be steel string, it could be really loud, it could be really soft. There's a whole bunch of different orchestration possibilities with a guitar in my hand. And then I kind of audition them, like, okay, you, try this and see how it sounds. And there's almost always a clear winner. The tune sort of, you know, makes its own uh, sort of preferences known. Probably for the first few years that I played, I regretted not continuing to be a trumpet player. Within the realm of the music that I love the most, trumpet is essential. Guitar at best is maybe we'll let you play. <laughs> I had to kind of fight through that in a way to the point where I guess once I got so I could sort of hang with horn players playing sort of in a post Coltrane harmonic language that you know I was very interested in and uh, not to mention just dealing with Charlie Parker and and all of that stuff I started to think about well okay I'm going to be a guitar player I'm I'm here, this is it. You know, quote unquote, jazz guitar at that point in time was a guy usually sitting with a guitar or something like this and an amp, and that was that. And to me, it was sort of like, well, man, when I hear the saxophone player play or the piano player play or the drummer, it sounds like the sound is coming from all over the place, but the jazz guitar thing, it's always very local to wherever the amp is. So the first thing that I did, and this is when I was playing in Kansas City, was that I started using two amps, just so that I could have them spread out. And I was like, okay, well, maybe it doesn't have to be just this. Maybe it can be something more than this. And that sort of began this process that continues to now of like, yeah, but. And I mean, I try to spend my life in the state of, yeah, but. That led to different kinds of things. First, you know, just various acoustic guitars. Then I read about it somewhere, Nashville tuning, where you take the bottom four strings, you put on light gauge strings, and you tune it up an octave so that actually your G string is higher than your E string. And with that tuning, I started playing this phrase, which became the opening phrase of phase dance, which would not exist any other way. I, by that time, I was living in Boston, teaching at Berkeley. I was playing with Gary Burton's band. Right around that same time, I ran into a guy who had a company he just started called Lexicon. And he said, we're going to make this thing called a digital delay. And I was like, that sounds cool. I go out there, and I'm like, couldn't I put it so there was an amp on one side and an amp on the other, but they were delayed. And he's like, yeah, and we can even modulate it. So they made this little sine wave thing and put it on there. And, you know, then I played that phase dance thing and there was this sound like, I mean, people would just stop. Like Now nobody would even blink, but at the time it was like, what is that? You know, it was just like a completely new sound. And I have to always give credit to Gary Burton because 
you know, I could have made my first record two and a half years earlier than that. And Gary was really like, no, no. He, he kept saying to me, you may only make one record. Make sure this is that record. And that caused me to really sort of refine what my idea was of what, you know, tunes could be and, and the, the whole kind of general harmonic language that's still the fundamental thing for me. My sense of guitar was so rudimentary and kind of has in a lot of ways remained that way. And one of the earliest things was that I don't think I ever changed the strings on my 175 from the time I bought it until maybe I had started playing with Gary. Um, and I kind of liked how they sounded. They were these flat wound strings that were really dead. And so I asked Jim and everybody, could you make a string that sounds kind of dead? <laughs> and they did. I was like, oh, that's cool, you know, that uh, that's, it's possible to have a relationship with a company and a, a, a genius inventor person where some of these ideas or thoughts or methods could manifest themselves. That began this thing of, you know, what we used to call the dead wounds. But I mean, I started to then really go extreme with 12 strings and put only unwound strings and tune them to chords and stuff. And that became like San Lorenzo or Ice Fire around that time. Kind of at the core, no matter what, was still this guy sitting there with an amp, with an arch top. I, I often describe it like it's sort of like I built this house and that house is the thing and that's bright size life, right? And then I just keep adding on wings to the house, but that's still the foundation. And there's all these different wings and each year there's a kind of new addition that might be had. And some of the new additions really did not work at all and that part of the house crumbled and had to call the trash company to pick it up. I mean, it's, it's definitely, you know, trial and error, but uh, that's sort of the basic thing for me. There were many, many years that I changed strings every single day. My theory being, okay, well then it's consistent because it, you know, because they do change after you've played a couple, especially a sweaty gig, they change a little bit. At the moment, I'm kind of reverting not all the way back to the dead wound thing, but I'm digging strings that are a little bit played in. However, there's a real issue, which is intonation is a huge thing for me. I mean, for me, especially in the world of acoustic guitars, really has to be in tune. So there's a point where a string that can even be a few days is going to start to suffer a little bit. It's different and it's different with steel strings than it is with nylon strings. Nylon strings, you know, there's this thing like, oh god, we should probably change the strings, but we can't change the strings if we're going to play the next day because they're going to stretch. I mean, there's a million little details like that. You know, then there's also some weird requests. We're kind of in the middle of one right now, which is this idea that I've had there are electronic ways to have your low E string be down an octave, but it's just not as cool as like that register. So that was one of those, how hard would it be kind of thing to get a low E string? And of course, it doesn't really fit in a guitar thing, you know, the, the whole. So we're kind of, you know, on the hunt for the best possible solution. So it's great to have the resources of the company to investigate possibilities of different ways of thinking about strings and how they can be used and uh, it's something I really value. You know it's probably been 20 years now since there's been a guitar solo on a major hit. And certainly there was a peak period that probably began with like the Beatles on the Ed Sullivan show up to the point where Kurt Cobain did this in a joking way to make fun of Eddie Van Halen. To me, that was this window where it was like, okay, if you're like a really good player, there's a problem there. I think that we are in a period right now where that's, you know, guitar is not that same thing. My oldest son, who's great, 
he's a, he's a really cool guy. He always has an interesting perspective. When he was about eight, he said, I like it, but he said, you know, guitar, it's, it's just so 20th century. However, you know, all it is is an instrument. And I mean, all anything is, is just a potential manifestation tool. You know, it is an interesting instrument because nobody agrees on it. Nobody agrees how to hold it. Nobody agrees how to touch it. Nobody agrees how to play it. Every person that picks it up finds their own way to do it. There's no other instrument quite like that. Almost every instrument has a, like, this is how you play that instrument. There is not that with the guitar. And, you know, that's pretty cool. My name is Andre Chumley, and uh, I'm tech for Pat Metheny, tech for myself and people like Ike Willis, Ray White, and my Zappa tribute band, so kind of unprofessionally. My first kind of major guitar tech gig was Al Demiola in 2006. Pat's a perfectionist, which I love. I've worked with a lot of perfectionists. He really makes sure that for the audience, looks, sounds, everything's really as good as possible. So I'm learning that uh, you just push the envelope. He's one of the technology pioneers in guitar. Um, one of the, him and Lyle May is getting an Oberheim and the Synclavier and all that and the Roland. So he's always interested in new stuff. Right when we've thought, okay, cool, we've set it up, that's it, you know, maybe the next day he'll say, hey, could we da 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 and we kind of go, yeah, <laughs> we'll figure it out. So that's been good surprises, you know, he's always, uh, thinking of ways to take the music a little further. The Dario, um, wow, and your products are really great. You know, the, we have cables throughout the stage, the, the Dario, we have uh, your picks, his, his picks are custom. The strings, kind of the second most important thing after the construction of the guitar, perhaps. Strings are great, and we love that as we keep track with the Dario, it seems like your engineers are always figuring out new alloys and new types of strings. The bottom line, the strings are great. <laughs>